So on behalf of uh, our Quadro Liquids team and our India channel partners, Back to Chem engineers and consultant, I welcome all our guests in the today's webinar. Uh, today we have uh, two speakers for the event and please allow me a minute to briefly introduce them with you. Our uh, keynote speaker for today is Mr. Wayne Harwood. Uh, Wayne is National Sales Manager for Quadro Liquid and based at our Waterloo Canada facility. Uh, he has very rich experience working on different high share mixing applications and earlier worked as an application engineer in our Quadro lab performing R&D testing and customer trials. So today he's going to share some good insight on the API wet milling technology. Our second speaker is Mr. Kyle Everson. Kyle is our application manager and specializes in wide range of mixing applications. He will share his expertise on the cost and economy aspect of API wet milling process. So I will shortly hand it over to our speaker. Just a few housekeeping things before that. Uh, request all our guests to please keep their microphone muted during the webinar. Uh, this will help to minimize the background noise and better audio clarity. If you have any question during the webinar, please text your question in the chat window and we will ensure to answer it. This way we can better handle your question. However, if needed, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. There is also a raise hand button available to draw the attention. And we have also kept 10 minutes at the end for Q&A session. However, appreciate your question anytime during the webinar. And uh, just for the information of all our attendees, this uh, webinar session is being recorded. So thank you very much and appreciate your cooperation. So with that, I will hand it over to Wayne for further discussion. Over to you, Wayne. Thank you, Delji. I appreciate the, the great introduction. Um, looking forward to this and hope that everyone on the line can, can gain some, some knowledge about uh, API wet milling and, and how to apply the HP technology for that. Just before I get started, I wanted to, to highlight here it's very early and I have a couple of dogs and some young children. So if there's any background noise, I apologize in advance, uh, but we'll try to keep that to a minimum. Again, thank you for coming. We're going to talk today about uh, groundbreaking, a groundbreaking API wet milling technology and three different ways that we can help you improve your wet milling process. So I want to start off just by talking a little bit about who we are. Uh, I know Delji gave us a great introduction, uh, but it goes beyond just, just the three of us. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the rest of the group and where we fit in within IDEX. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit uh, on an overview on the HV series, uh, what, what's special about it and, and what kind of uh, sets it apart from, from the rest of the competition. And then we'll get into the three different ways we, we want to highlight to you today. And those include the reduced cost, high performance of the, the mill, and then also the scalability of the process. So to start out, just to touch on who IDEX is. IDEX is a, it's a large holding company that exists. Uh, it traded on the New York Stock Exchange. It is uh, made up of a wide variety of equipment um, within that profile. Everything from pumping technology to different health and science technologies that help drive uh, things like uh, vaccine testing and uh, different eye care solution or different optim optim optimalic business units to things like the, the company that produces the jaws of life. And then, then we also have on the dispensing equipment side, things like uh, paint dispensing equipment and on the process side, a lot of uh, equipment like ourselves that are that handle material processing, uh, powder dispersion, wet milling, dry milling, bulk handling, uh, a wide variety of, of product products. And so within that, as mentioned, there's the IDEX Material Processing Technology Group. 
And that's where we fit in. And within that group, we, we can help service just about any industry that's out there. Everything that includes pharmaceutical, food, chemical, and, and, and the like. So within the MPT group, we've got, uh, again, a, a range of equipment here from compactors, which are a large part of the pharmaceutical world as well, uh, to dry mills, which, which many of you are probably familiar with. And also, as we're going to talk about in large part today, our wet milling technology. Ask the, thank you. Uh, to screeners and classifiers, and, and then large bulk handling material processes as well. So within the IDEX MPT group, there is quite a variety of equipment that we can help you solve different problems with. And then if we look at who Quadro is, well, Quadro's a business that's been around for quite some time now, approaching 45 years at this point. Um, it started off as four gentlemen in their garage who had an idea to, to build a, a dry mill, essentially. And they were going to use that mill to help reclaim cookies, of all things. Um, but early on, it, it grew rapidly and, and developed into a mill that was well suited for the pharmaceutical industry. And, and that from that point, with those four, four people, we've grown to over 150 employees on, on site. Uh, we're spread across two different buildings there in, in Waterloo. And essentially, you know, we now produce not just the Quadro product, but also Fitzpatrick microfluidics products as well. And, and now Steridose, which was a recent addition to, to the facility. So we've come a long way uh, and we're, we're very proud of where we, we have evolved to. Within the, the Quadro Liquids group, and, and um, also touches a little bit on microfluidics, there, there's a range of equipment, like we mentioned. So we've got our, our jet mixer, which is an in-tank mixing solution. Uh, great for gentle mixing, solid suspensions, and uh, high viscosity blending as well. Uh, then we have our powder disperser. Many of you may already be familiar with it. It's an inline powder disperser, high shear mixer. Great for dispersing your difficult to disperse powders uh, that are tough to put into solution and will help you eliminate a lot of the problems that come with those powders. Uh, we then also have a couple of inline devices, our, our Quadro Ytron Z emulsifier, and then the HV emulsifier and wet mill, which we're going to touch on today. Those two units handle different ranges of of processing within the same framework. So they, they, they both emulsify, they both mill, but they're gonna do it at different scales of energy and, and just overall different levels. When it comes to wet milling, we're focused in on the HV. And, and so that's what we're gonna we'll talk about a lot today. And again, now Daljit already kind of introduced the three of us. I don't know if he did a great job of introducing himself. So I'll touch on Daljit a little bit. Uh, Daljit has been with us for Going on eight or nine years now, I believe, Deljeet. And way back when, Deljeet and I worked together when he first came on in our applications lab. And, and it was uh, he's, out, he's been a great asset to us over the years for the Quadro Liquids Group. He's recently come back to us to, to help, and, and we're excited to have him back in the fold working with the Quadro Liquids technology. Thanks, Amin. So if we move on, we're going to start talking a little bit about the HV emulsifier. Now, there, there's three different sizes to the unit. So in the, the picture here, this is our kind of key slide, title slide. Um, you can see on the in the forefront, that's our HV0, the smallest, the pilot scale unit. And then we've got the HV1 in the background. That's the first kind of production scale size. Um, so if we look at the overall scale of emulsifying and wet milling and, and size reduction and compare where our equipment fits with each other, kind of mentioned this already, but the Z emulsifier is a little bit lower energy. If we were talking an emulsion, for example, you're going to target the one to five micron range, whereas the HV, we're going to be able to start targeting those submicron emulsions and some very fine dispersions, cell disruptions, and most importantly to this conversation, we're going to be wet milling APIs. Uh, in general, 
we can take it and do a lot of things that most rotor skaters simply couldn't do. And we even start to close the gap between what a wet mill, a rotor skater wet mill, and a piston homogenizer can do. So, exciting stuff. If we look at it from an energy input scale, we've got uh, where the conventional rotor stator emulsifier used to fit is energy dissipations in the 100 or 1,000 to 100,000 watts per kilogram, whereas the high pressure homogenizer was, was in that kind of up to 100 million range. So there, there's quite a difference between the standard, like the Z emulsifier, and, and where the uh, high pressure homogenizer fits. And, and so there, there's a gap here, and we wanted to fill that gap when we created the HV, and, and we think we've done a great job of doing that. This sample here tells us how we're doing that. So I mentioned the, uh, the, the Z emulsifier is typically in that 100,000 watt per kilogram range, and that's a unit that runs at 25 meters per second. Now, if we look at the energy dissipation at a given tip speed, we can start to examine how that's changing. And it's an exponential curve in terms of the energy that's being input into the process as you increase your tip speed. So if we look at it, as we go up to about 45 meters per second, that's where we're starting to see that kind of first order of magnitude, that 10 times increase in the energy input into the product. But if we continue up that path and we get to 70 meters per second, which is where that HV is capable, then we see we're now putting in up to 55 times more energy into the product. And that's going to translate into smaller droplet sizes and smaller particle sizes. So if we look at it from an emulsion standpoint, which we can often do, it's, a, it's often a lot easier to do, then as we increase our tip speed, we're going to dissipate that energy and that's going to turn into a smaller droplet size. Now the blue band on the left that's the limit of our rotor and stator, our typical conventional rotor and stator. So the Z emulsifier, we mentioned you can get up maybe close to 30 meters per second overall. Uh, most of them settle out at 25. But you can see you're, you're leveling off around that one micron range as a, as a minimum. And so as we increase that, that's where we can start to generate those nano sized results, getting as low with emulsion work, we've, we've seen as low as about 150 micron with the HV. And now a lot of that does come back to the emulsion chemistry, but you need the energy to get there as well. So that's our quick highlight of what the HV is, where it fits and, and kind of what it can do. Uh, we're gonna talk now a little bit about the high performance capabilities of the HV and some of the, the great results that we've gotten from, from the work being done in the field and with some of our, our global partners that have been using this now for, for a number of years. So, as we mentioned, the conventional rotor stator will settle out in that 23, and there are actually some competitive equipment that will go up into the 40 meter per second range. However, with the HV's ability to reach 70 meters per second, it can do so much more. Uh, a lot of the studies that have been actually published have been done so by Merck, and, and they've uh, put that information out into the world, and that's been great for us in terms of being able to present that information to you today. And I've got a couple of references here just so that you can see where some of this information is coming from. Um, you know, these aren't results that we share unwillingly. We, we take confidentiality to, to great heart and, you know, we're fortunate enough to be able to share these results. And, and actually some of the contacts here have expressed to us over the years that they are very much willing to talk to anyone that's interested in the HV technology and, and give them some feedback from a customer to, to just see how great the technology is and, and how much it's changed their, their, their performance and their results. So if at the end of the day, you have interest in speaking with any of the folks, please do ask and, and we can put you into contact with, with some of the folks there. 
Um, so some of these studies do go back a bit. I think the AAPS original poster was, was back in the early 2010s. So, you know, we're coming up on 10 years and, and that's a great time. A lot of the cycle time with, with this type of technology is about 10 years before it really breaks free. Once a lot of the R&D is done, and it, it's, it's typically in that kind of 10 year turnaround for materials to start hitting the production market and, and folks maybe like yourselves that are beginning to apply API wet milling to, to their processes uh, in, a, in the wet form. Hopefully you guys are starting to see that. So if we jump in, we can take a look at some of the results that Merck has published and this particular study. This was one of the first studies that they did um, where they were actually just evaluating what the true impact of the 70 meter per second tip speed is relative to a 23 meters per second unit. Um, this was not our, our 23 meter per second unit, but it was one of our competitors. And, and so that was, it was great information for us to have here. Um, as you increase to that 20 meters or 70 meters per second, you can see some of the results that we gain. And they actually published this study based on the results from 10 different compounds. Uh, we're looking here at the change that is, was, recognized in the mean value and the D95 in those given products. And we can see here uh, with these products, we were getting into the range of just over 10 micron uh, in terms of the mean particle size. And previously, those same materials were up in the, the 30 micron range. So on average, they stated that they saw a basically a 40% decrease in the average and mean, or sorry, and D95s of these particulate. Uh, all of these were crystalline API products, different aspect ratios, uh, different particle size, or sorry, different starting particle sizes as well. Uh, so a lot of great results came from this study. And we actually, on the next slide here, they were, they also published some great electron microscope images showing the, the differences of one of the particular products that they ran. And it's, it's amazing to see it at this level, just how much of a change you've got. You don't have any of those, those very large particulate anymore, which is a testament to, to how well the HV was able to size reduce on, a, on mass, basically eliminating any of those larger pieces and really creating a uniform particle size. It's not just that it's small, it, it's that you've got a lot more uniformity. And if, if we compare that, that's one of the biggest benefits of our co-mill over the years as well is, is that uniformity. And so with, with this industry, having a uniform particle size tends to be very beneficial to, to the next stages of whether it's drug delivery or, or drug composition. So not only can the HV be used for size reducing after the fact, but some of the other work that's now being done over the last couple of years is for bottom up processing. And so for those of you that may or may not be familiar, I, I imagine most of you are, but for bottom up processing, we're gonna take and form those crystals to a particle size from the start by controlling the reaction as it's occurring that's growing the crystals and actually cutting it off and size reducing that particulate right inside the HV. So by bringing together the, the phases that initiate that crystallization reaction right inside of the action zone of the HV, we can actually start and cut off that reaction instantaneously. And, and you can actually grow your particulate to very, very small particle size. Uh, some, not as many results have been published on this particular side of things, but some of the results that I've personally seen have been in under 10 microns, certainly in the three to five micron range it has been shown to be possible using this approach with the HV technology. And so that's exciting news for us. I know a lot of folks with their API processes are looking for particulate to be as small as they can because it, it simply, it improves the drug delivery. So that's a key factor and something that's gonna be great for a lot of you, I think. 
Now, we also mentioned earlier, it is an effective unit when it comes to emulsion performance as well. And I just want to show you a quick sample here on emulsion performance relative to the conventional rotor and stator. Now, this particular slide was only testing 60 meters per second, which isn't necessarily the full capability, but we can see almost a just under a five times reduction in the average droplet size relative to that 25 meter per second unit. Uh, this particular emulsion, really high concentration of oil actually, it was an 18% soybean oil. We're still getting in around that 0.5 micron range on the average and effectively um, driving down a more uniform distribution as well. And, and this is all single pass work, I should point out as well. When, when it comes to an emulsion, Single pass is often what is required. It, it tends not to need continuous recirculation for the large part. So within that HV, we actually, so we've got a couple different sets of tooling that we like to apply. Um, we label them, as, as you see here, progressive wet milling, which on the basic level is to mill materials that are starting off at a little bit of a larger particle size. So the first stage that the particles will see is a little bit larger. So it lets that material into the tooling so that it can begin to be broken down. Um, then we have our fine wet milling tooling, which has a 0.5 millimeter slot all the way around. And, and that is the tooling that we've seen used most often in, in this particular industry for API wet milling. It's got going to give you the finest grind and it gets you there a little bit quicker too. Ultimately, both the progressive wet milling and the fine wet, wet milling tooling will reach the same level of particle size reduction. The fine wet milling tooling will just get you there a little quicker as long as you can get your material into the tooling. Uh, and then lastly, our emulsion tooling on the far right, that is again, a larger gap, which may be a little bit uh, not intuitive, but we get a finer droplet size out of a larger gap, in part because we create more turbulence inside of that, that unit, and that's going to help drive that uh, droplet into a smaller size. Okay, so we're going to move on to our scalability section. And we'll talk here a little bit again. Some of this will relate to, to work done internally. And then some of it, when it comes to milling, will relate to, to work done outside as well that we can, we can share with you here. So a little bit of humor to start, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure everyone on the call has dealt with the challenge at some point in time in terms of how to scale up. You know, we, we can't always go from, from those beakers on the, in the lab to you know giant sized beakers out in the plant floor it simply doesn't work so scale up is a challenge that that every industry faces uh, we all go from you know making something at a, a very small level up to uh, full scale production and, and being able to scale it is critical and in in this world scale up is costly because the, the cost of your ingredients is through the roof more often than not. So being able to, to have confidence in, in the overall scaling process, I think is going to help uh, in, in the long run drive great results for you. So if we start looking at it on a base level. A lot of folks out there will try to scale on shear rate. So shear rate is, is as most of you probably know, uh, a function of the angular velocity of a moving plate and the gap between a stationary plate. Now in a rotor stator, you have an extra factor to consider because the material isn't just sitting in between that plate and spinning around. That material is being pumped through the unit. So there's a lot more to scaling than simple shear rate when it comes to processing through a rotor stator device. So we have to take that those extra factors into account or will we'll never get you an accurate scaling model. So to build on that, if we were to try to scale on the basis of shear rate alone, uh, we would, now this is for an emulsion, but we would take a look at what we've got here and, and starting from the red curve, that's our infeed sample. 
our green and blue are two different processes, uh, two different flow rates, but everything else is constant in terms of shear rate. So as I mentioned, the, the tip speed is the same and the gap is the same, but we get very, very different results. So you could not effectively scale this process based on shear rate alone, simply because the flow changed. And, and so that's a factor that we're gonna have to take into consideration. Now there's a few more things that we, we wanna take a look at as well, but it's important to know that you can't just scale off of shear rate. So if we take a look at the factors that we want to focus in on for scaling, tooling geometry being number one. Now that takes into consideration some of that shear, shear rate theory. So the tooling geometry includes the gap in between the teeth, for example. So it's a part of it. We, we, we talk about it, but it's only one part. The tip speed is the second part. Now that also is a factor of, of shear rate because that's the angular velocity piece of, of the equation. That's how fast that rotor is going. Uh, and then that third factor that we need to talk about, the flow rate going through the unit, we look at it in terms of slot velocity. And, and so any given set of tooling has a different open area based on the slot width. For, and we need to take into consideration how fast that material is actually passing through the unit and, and through the individual teeth of the unit in order to effectively scale. When it comes to wet milling, we also, there's an add on to the theory. Uh, it it's, was coined the slot event theory by Merck, and it takes into consideration the probability of a particle being hit as it passes through that tooling. And so we, when it comes to scaling up an API wet milling process, we'll, we'll take that theory into consideration and, and we can effectively scale using that. So combining these four factors will enable us to help you scale effectively. Now, if we, if we jump back and show another sample of an emulsion process, this time using the factors in the model that we developed, and, and we actually coined that model a precision TKE or a slot velocity scale up model. And when we do so, we can now show extremely close results in terms of the overall scale up process. So again, red line is our, our initial incoming emulsion droplet and the green and blue, not a whole lot of difference there. Less than 1% area under the curve is different. So we're getting effectively a, a accurate scale up using this model. And this, I should note, was going, it was done on our Z emulsifier at the time, but it shows a five to one scale up ratio between those two pieces of equipment, our Z1 and our Z5. And we can apply this same model to our HV technology as well. Now, when it comes to wet milling, we talked a little bit about the slot event model and, and the next couple slides here identify some of the work that was done there by Merck and the different dimensions that needed to be taken into account to figure out what's going on. How, what's the probability of that particle being hit as it passes through? So you can see here there, there's three different areas. There's the number of slots that obviously plays a part in the open area. Then there's actually, there is a gap that exists just above the, the top of the tooth and the base of the stator. So there's a very low probability of materials passing through there, but we have to take it into consideration. Uh, and then there's the actual height of the slot as well. So those three factors add up to the, the total open area in any given set of tooling. And we need to take those into consideration and figure out what that is in our probability calculation. So, um, as they built up that model, they're using that to calculate the total area of the slots. And in terms of the overall scale up, if we look at it on the same set of tooling, so say the half millimeter set of tooling for the HV1 versus the HV0, the, the HV1 actually has about three times the number of slots as the HV0. Now, we, we can certainly work with 
the number of slots that exist on the fine slot tooling. So there's different ways that we can apply the tooling as well. The second one, the area in the vertical distance between the rotor and stator that exists, and it's the same regardless of any set of tooling, that is always the same. So we can consider that. And the area of the slot itself, the actual height width, that also stays the same. So those two factors always stay the same. Um, correction, the, the area of the slot will vary based on the width of the slot. So we do have to take that into consideration. The height always stays the same, the width will change. Um, but in general, the HV1 has approximately two times the probability of the HV0 for a particle to be impacted as it passes through. So what that means is we can apply this model to, to say that if you are running a process at the pilot scale on your HV0, the number of turnovers or number of passes through the HV0, it would take approximately one half the number of passes to achieve the exact same results when you scale up to the HV1, because there's twice the probability that a particle is going to be impacted as it passes through. And that's important to know, because that, that tells us that when we're operating on that pilot scale, we, we do have to take into consideration the number of turnovers and know that when we run, say, 40 tank turnovers, we're only gonna have to do that 20 tank turnovers when we get to the process scale, which might make a big impact on your decision whether or not you use that particular mill for your process. So just to put the theory to test, they did a number of uh, trials and published some of the results here. The graphs are somewhat, uh, I mean, they can be a little difficult to read, but the overall uh, information is there. If we look at the, the one on the right here, you've got basically the number of passes it was taking for the HB0. And using the model, we predicted how many passes it would take using the HB1. And then they actually have the results of the HB1 as well. And you can see using that model, they were able to effectively predict how many turnovers it would take using the HB1 based on the trials they did with the HV0 to effectively scale that process and say, now, instead of, if we look at this point, for example, they were running 50 turnovers. And based on that model, they predicted that they would only need to run about 12 turnovers with that given set of tooling, and it proved out. So excellent results here and provides great feedback for a scaling model for this technology. So overall, with the scalability step, if we were to, we as mentioned, we incorporate that frequency and the probability into the model to effectively predict. And what that does is allow them, in this case, and, and allow any, any one of yourselves as well in the future here to, to work with very, very small samples in the lab. Um, in this case, they used about a 20 gram sample to predict the performance of their pilot, or sorry, their, their pilot and production units. And that is huge, because that's going to translate into significant savings, which my colleague, Kyle, will ultimately tell us about in a couple of minutes. So if we jump back here, I mentioned at the very beginning, there's three different sizes to the HV. The HV0, often used for pilot scale, there is actually, a, because the housing volume here is only about 100 milliliters on the HV0, you can actually work with some very, very small samples with a nice compact circulatory or single pass setup. In our lab in Waterloo, we've run samples as small as, as three to 400 milliliters. Uh, it's, it's done on a single pass, and, and what that translates to is, is you having to use very little material to get some accurate results, which based on the last couple slides can tell you what you're going to get when you run up to the larger units, the HV1, which is often used for pilot scale work or, or in a lot of cases, production scale work. Um, and then our largest unit, the HV3, you can see the, the range of production rates that they can get. Now, these, these flow rates that are predicted here they're, they're typically applied for that 70 meters per second tip speed. So 
An important note, if your process doesn't require that full tip speed, you tend to be able to increase the flow through the unit because the limiting factor more often than not is the horsepower of the, that unit when you run at the full speed. So you can gain some, some flow back if you don't need that full tip speed. Oh, I'm going to turn it over here to my colleague, Kyle. Uh, you're in great hands. He's, uh, a, as Deljeet mentioned, our application sales manager and a wealth of experience here. He's got some uh, personal stories to share and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Kyle. All right. All thanks, right. Wayne. Thanks, Wayne. So I'm going to so ask I'm Wayne to drive me here. here. Uh, Wayne, if you could just mute yourself real quick. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Maybe if you want to pop that back up. Okay. So good afternoon, India. Um, just want to reiterate that I, like Wayne, have dogs. And uh, it's quite early here, so they're not out of bed yet. But when they get up, they are quite noisy. I have a cat that they like to chase. So I apologize in advance. Just want to say thank you for holding on for this final section where we'll dive into costing and how it impacts both your teams and the people who depend on your products uh, that you guys manufacture. So Wayne, can you kick it to the next slide? All right. So a little bit of a personal story to get started here, guys. Um, just give me one second. So every time I do a presentation like this, I like to start with uh, a personal story just to give you guys a little bit of an idea of uh, who we are and why we do what we do at IDEX MPT through the Quadra Liquids team. I'm not gonna say that I am speaking for Daljeet and Wayne completely on this, but I like to tell this story, kind of touch on a common bond that we all share. Uh, but before we get to that, like I said, as I mentioned before, um, my focus today will be on the commercial benefits that the HV has brought to many of the largest pharmaceutical companies throughout the world. Uh, more importantly, to me anyways, I like to outline what my why statement is before I share all this stuff with you. Um, just to kind of connect the dots with the work that you guys do and the everyday end user that depends on your product. So you guys are probably asking yourselves, what do I mean by my why statement? So my why statement is my family. Um, it's the reason why I get out of bed every day. It's the reason why I got up early this morning to share this presentation with you guys. Um, more importantly, the lady you see on the screen, she's at the very center of my why statement. So um, just before anyone asks, yes, that is me proposing to her. That's not my daughter. It's actually my future wife. So we're getting married in about two weeks. And uh, let me tell you, it was a roller coaster to try and plan a wedding amid COVID. Um, so Jen was diagnosed six years ago with an autoimmune disease that impacted our lives and more directly her quality of life immensely. At the time, Jen was still in school finishing her kinesiology degree and we were a single income household. Her medication was insanely expensive, but extremely effective. Uh, luckily for us, the company who produced the medication she needs had a compassionate care program in place to make it easier for us to acquire, you know, the medication to allow her to live a more normal lifestyle. So the reason why I share this personal story with you guys is to drive home the importance and impact of the work you guys do every day. In my time working with folks like you across the globe, I've come to learn that this industry and its people have at its core a focus on making the daily human experience better. Uh, unfortunately, the major hurdles that are associated with the work that you guys do are often costing. Um, it's extremely expensive to bring new medications to market, and that's generally through validation costs, so your trials and all that good stuff. Um, you know, the budgetary constraints are really what makes it so difficult to bring those things to market. So at this point, um, we always ask ourselves, like, why, why, is, why am I bringing this up? Um, it's because you guys need funding to, to you know, make your products effective and to bring the new products to market. So for me, uh, I look at it from this perspective. The end user, you guys are always looking for, how can I make a more affordable product for the end user? How can I make it scalable and go to market more easily? And finally, how can I keep this profitable to keep our company you know, on track so we can keep our doors open and continue that. Our goal in this portion of the presentation is to showcase how the HV technology is capable 
but making all the above easier. And we'll start with a comparative approach with the main competitive technology we see in this portion of the market. So I'm going to ask chat, you know, if you guys want to take a few guesses at what we had mentioned before, I know Wayne kind of kind of winked at it earlier. What do you guys think our most competitive technology is? If you guys could just give me an answer in chat, I'll give you a couple minutes to, to shoot us a message here. If you guys want to, if you don't, that's cool too. All right, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. We're not seeing any, any, any uh, pulse from you guys. So let's kick it over to the next slide, Wayne. Wayne, can you hear me? Can you kick it to the next slide, please? <laughs> Sorry, guys, this is a little bit of a disconnect sometimes here. So we're going to take the comparative approach. Our main competitive technology is uh, a piston homogenizer. Um, so make no mistake, this isn't a, a session that's meant to, you know, be mudslinging or, or talk negatively about the piston homogenizer. They've been an incredible technology and they've carried process forward for many years. So I'm not here to tell you that the HV is going to solve all your problems, but it's definitely the necessary evolution in this market space to allow API wet milling to get to that next level. Um, in my opinion, the HV is an engineering marvel. It's given some of the brightest minds like yourselves the tools and capability to create better products more affordably, safely, and intelligently. It saves our end users money through obvious lanes like the upfront capital expenditure cost. So the general cost of the HV is much lower. It also saves money in often overlooked areas such as power consumption, uh, footprint, what I call real estate costs, so here, what I like to focus on is by reducing the footprint, you can even increase your available production space and, um, you know, even make it an easier environment for your research staff to work in if they're, they're looking to develop some new products. Um, it improves your maintenance costs and spends, and in many abrasive API cases can not only pay back within a calendar year, but drive the bottom line profits up. So this might be a bit of a dated figure, but most healthy business operate on a five to one ratio when it comes to determining a healthy return on investment. So this means that a sound investment should pay itself back within five years. When you consider this technology is not only paying itself off within a calendar year, but also driving profits up, it's kind of hard to believe that you guys are not already using it. So th this, the, uh, this statement is the most consistent challenge I end up getting from end users who are using our technology until they actually try it. So when they try it, they're blown away by the, you know, improvements that they're seeing across all of these uh, different cost kind of sectors in their business. So from there, it will also allow for low to high volume batching. So as you guys develop your products, you can start from an HV0 on a bench scale, as Wayne said, doing, you know, samples as low as 500 milliliters. And then you can actually take them up to a scalable market um, and start to pilot scale a product and take some product to market or you know do your validation tests it's fully scalable from the hv0 to the hv3 so you don't have to reinvent the wheel when you go to scale up and, and if all that wasn't enough it also requires less manpower to operate and clean it's steam in place and clean in place ready um, this is of course dependent on your internal cleaning practices as well as local regulations so you know you got to take that with a grain of rice you got to figure out that Internally, if you guys have practices that supersede um, what we find to be allowable, well, then, I mean, you know, you'll have to uh, account for that. So, Wayne, can you kick it to the next slide for me? So, this is uh, probably the shadiest looking salesman you've ever seen. Um, he's asking you to trust him. And, and at this point, we've told you about our findings. We told you about our studies and our overall experience in developing this technology. Um, and if you're anything like me, you're probably questioning the bias that our data is bringing forward. I mean, of course, we're gonna present positive data. We want you guys to try this technology out. We think it's incredible. And it's a privilege to have it in our offerings as it's kind of a blue water technology, the only of its kind on the planet. So this is also the point where I like to point out that most of our titles have the S word in it. And uh, S is for sales, which tends to plant a certain seed of doubt. So I'd be asking myself, am I being sold or is this objectively the technology we need to take our research to the next level? I would want some objective studies as Wayne had kind of showed earlier to show the technology that we're discussing today and, and make sure that what we're claiming is, you know, really truly that incredible. So Wayne, if you can kick it to that next slide. 
So what you see in front of you is another objective case from Merck. So we did some work with them um, and, and, you know, we want to showcase that this is not just a, a grounds of a, a quadro bias. So while it may seem pretty obvious that this was a lead into this material, is one of the many, many examples of unbiased objective data points produced by outside studies. Our work on API wet milling started nearly a decade ago um, when Merck brought a process problem forward. After all this time, we've finally started to see some widespread adoption throughout the globe. Uh, over the past year, three years, there's been an immense growth in this market. So, I mean, the, the above data speaks for itself. At 20,000 kilograms per year and $2,000 per kilogram, there's an annual savings of $400,000 for wet milling over dry milling. As APAI costs and or <laughs> amount produced increase, the savings increase. So what I'm talking about here is a unit that's probably going to run about 40000 uh, 35 to 40 thousand dollars USD, and if your cost savings are in the range of 400 thousand, you guys are already making money, which means more research dollars in your pocket, which means more capability to develop better products to, to take to market. So finally, in this last slide, um, I'm going to get Wayne to kick it over one more time. Um, we talk about the ROI calculator. So when we take into consideration your current process, uh, we're not just going, okay, what is what is the competitive technology doing that we're not doing? Um, we're actually taking into consideration the cost to make a batch and um, what drives kind of our narrative when we start to look at the HV displacing other technology. So the tool that we use is our ROI calculator. As you can see on the screen, it is taking into consideration every facet of what you guys do uh, from a costing perspective. Our ultimate goal is to drive your costs down and pull your bottom line up. We want to have the proper tool and solution for your process. If the HV is that solution, we want to spend, we want you to spend what's necessary to acquire the technology. We want to help you to optimize your process and approach. Finally, we want to make you guys as much money as possible uh, through the improvements and capabilities that this is going to offer. So I want to drive this point home um, and this is probably the salesman in me. This is not a 100% altruistic transaction. Our, our goal is to have you guys buy this technology, try it out and, and be blown away by it. Make your savings, make your improvements, make your profit and then buy more machines because this is only going to, um, you know, compound your, your effectiveness as you go to market with new uh, products. So um, with that, I mean, if anybody's interested in taking a look and doing a comparative approach, you know, reach out to Dalji, reach out to the team. We can actually take you guys through the ROI calculator, which is um, a little too big to fit on the screen right now, and uh, take you through step by step to show you where your cost savings are actually going to be. Uh, and with that, I'll kick it back over to Wayne. Okay, so uh, thanks. Uh, Wayne and Kyle for the great uh, insight on the HV technology and uh, how it helps improve API wet milling process. And I uh, appreciate Kyle for sharing your personal story. Thanks. Uh, we have a bit exceeded our scheduled time, but trust you find uh, our today's session informative and uh, time well invested. If you have any question, please submit it uh, through the chat window or please unmute yourself. Okay, so uh, we will we will share this slide. We will share this uh, recording available to all of our uh, attendees. So uh, thanks for joining. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with us or our Backpokem team. Uh, if you have any future queries or would like to discuss more about your mini application, uh, we have a demo HP unit available in India now with the Backpokem team to conduct proof of concept and product trial. So please let us know if you are interested in the HP wet milling trial. So uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Um, last but not the least, okay, okay. I have, we have one question over here, uh, team. Okay. So uh, it's from Ajit. Uh, how does it solve elasticity of uh, particle issue?
Well, that's a that's a good question. Now, the the overall 